So I've finally gotten around to editing some old footage of our epic road trip that had been stashed away and just begging to finally be worked on. Just as I started to lighten that burden and make some progress, COVID-19 hit and interrupted my editing groove, to say the very least. So episode two of that is going to have to be put on hold just for a little while. But there was a different project that was also waiting for me to tackle. And it was as good a time as ever to finally start to do just that. So if you haven't guessed already, I'm building a home wall. This is my way of coping while I'm trapped inside. The gyms are closed. I'm not supposed to climb in my local climbing area. So this is my way of coping. Or I guess it's my, my second way of coping. Anyway, I'm gonna document the process. Hopefully I don't screw it up. And if I do, maybe you'll learn something. And hopefully it's all done by the time it's all over and I'm allowed to climb again. So stay tuned and I'll show you what the process looked like. So like most people, we realized very quickly that if we were going to be confined to our own homes, we needed to put in the effort to stay physically fit. Doing exercises like push-ups, hangboarding, pull-ups, and yes, even weighted pull-ups. But it became very apparent very quickly that although challenging, this wasn't very mentally stimulating, so we needed something else, and hence why we decided to build a home wall and cue my favorite program. Assuming you've seen my Boulder Breakdown videos, and if you haven't, you should check them out, but you probably already know that I love 3D. So the first thing I did was hop into 3D space and try to plan out how we wanted this to look, how to best use existing materials that we already had on hand, and more importantly, how I wanted this to function. This articulating climbing wall is what we came up with. Although we might just end up making this some kind of system wall, we're not making it a moon board or a tension board or kilter board or etc. board. We just want to have fun setting some problems and then fill it in as we go and it'll eventually become some type of spray wall that we can reset. I think part of the problem with home walls is that people just get bored with the constant canvas that never changes. So we designed something that can be adjusted using locking pins at 10 degree increments. So it can go from about a 15 degree overhang to a super 45 degree overhang. All right, let's just jump into the shop and get going. So yeah, this is the workshop. Um, it's not amazing, but it's the best we have. And I'm grateful we have it. It's a single car garage and it doubles as our storage area um, where we keep all the extra stuff that doesn't fit into our place. Uh, you can see some of the climbing equipment here for training, um, which hopefully I'm going to move this outside as well once I'm done building this climbing wall, which is what's going to happen here. But essentially what you really need to build this is T-nuts, you need the cap socket bolts that attach the holes to the T-nuts, you need to make sure that you have a drill and drill bits. Um, you need to make sure you have three quarter inch plywood, preferably like furniture grade. Um, I actually have some cheaper stuff because this is staying outside. Um, I'm not overly concerned with it lasting a long time. This is supposed to be kind of a temporary fix for me. Um, I'm also going to be framing it with pressure treated lumber. So it's going to be two by six mainly. Now to do this properly, you want to make sure that you're drilling at a 90 degree angle. There's actually uh, a drill guide that you can use. It's a tool you can get from uh, some hardware stores and it allows you to drill at a perfect 90 degree angle, which ensures that you're going to hammer in or mallet in or press in, however you're getting your T-nuts into your plywood, you're going to get them in perpendicular to the wood, which means it's gonna be perfectly a 90. So when you actually bolt your holds into the wall, you're gonna have less uh, room for it to spin. It's gonna be even, you're not gonna have any gaps behind the holds. Also, this means that you're less likely to de-thread or to rip out the T-nuts from the back of the wall because you want those T-nuts to sit as true as possible. Now, 
I don't have one of these drill guides, even though I say you should have it. Um, there's other options. One is just to try to keep your drill super straight and just drill them all. And most people probably do this and don't have a huge issue. So I decided I want to use my rudder. The only problem is it's not a true uh, plunge rudder. It's a fixed base rudder. You can try to make it a plunging rudder. Kind of works. Actually, I'll just show you. I've made this contraption right here. So essentially, I just got an extra substrate here. Hopefully you guys can see it. I put some uh, crosshairs um, along it so I can line this up with my grid lines that I'm eventually going to put on the plywood. And then I can plunge the router down into that exact crosshair and get like a perfect uh, 90 degree hole in there. This is not how this is supposed to be used. Again, you'd want a proper plunge router for that. But this is all I had, and I'm cheap, so um, this is gonna have to do. Um, but I think it should work out nicely. Um, and part of the reason I also added this wasn't just to line it up, it's also because you have to press on the actual spindle to push it down to get it to actually plunge. Uh, you're removing one hand from the actual router, which can cause it to have some kickback and twist, and then your hole jumps. And again, you want these holes to be nice and true. Uh, so I wanted to have something to free up my hand so I could start the spindle and press it down. So this allows me to have a platform to stand on with my feet, which lets me let go of my hand, and arguably is actually safer because now this thing will not go anywhere. Again, if you can just use a drill bit and use a guide, that's probably the best. You might actually be better off just using the drill bit, but this is what I've chosen to do. The other reason I did this is because I actually don't have a 7 16th bit which is what you need for the T-nuts for the back of this climbing wall. But I did have this bit here, which is 7 16th of an inch, uh, which is exactly what I want. <laughs> Fingers crossed that this whole thing works out. Um, I'll let you guys know and we'll see what happens. So um, I'm gonna go through the process of me building it so you're gonna see my mistakes or the things that work out really well. So just stay tuned and I guess you're gonna see how it all unfolds. Yeah. So here you can see me actually start to mark up the grid where I'm going to be drilling my T-nut holes. Essentially what I did was take a four foot scrap piece of plywood and mark it up like a ruler. So I had three inch spacing on the one end and then throughout it I had six inch spacing and then on the opposing end I put another three inches of spacing. This allowed me to put three inch spacing around the exterior of my sheet of plywood and then six inches in the middle. The three inches on the edges is so when you butt two different boards up to each other you get six inch spacing so you have that same spacing throughout the entire board that you put up on the wall. Then I just use a chalk line to mark up the actual grid. It's a super handy tool and if you ever plan on building a deck, it's a good idea to have one. All right, so I'm just gonna sit in the middle of this so you can see me. Um, as you can see, we've all the grid lines out. So I'll be taking my router and finding all these crosshairs and then plunging it in and cutting the holes for the T-nuts. But the first thing that we're gonna have to do is get some clamps and probably some screws just to fasten these two boards together so they don't shift. So as I plunge down into them, um, I'm cutting straight and all the holes are gonna be in the exact same grid. So the idea here is to drill as few times as possible. So if you can stack the wood together at all, it is a good idea. Now we're actually going to see how this thing works, which I, I hope is well. There is one thing first, and that is mask, ear protection, safety goggles. I think this is the uh, smartest way to go about this, so I'm going to put these on. Need the lid on first. All right, I think a smart person would probably start doing this at a corner just in case you destroy everything, but I'm just going to go into it and go right in the middle so you can see it. All right. 
Let's try this out. So this is the first hole that I made, so I did it a little more carefully and slowly, but the process was definitely slower than using a drill. I think it worked. <laughs> Looks good to me. I guess let's just uh, keep going. All right, so now starts the arduous task of actually putting all these holes in the wood. Um, I think I'd actually just like to use this opportunity for a second to say that if at any point in this video it seems like I'm taking the situation lightly, I can assure you that I'm not. Uh, if you've watched any of our driving videos or our road trip videos, you'll notice the stethoscope on our rear view mirror. That's because my wife is actually a frontline healthcare worker, so I am uh, vicariously directly affected by everything going on. So I just like to try to keep my videos light. I hope you appreciate that. All right, so here it is. That's a lot of holes. And it went reasonably well. I guess the big question um, I should be answering, well, I'm not entirely sure anyone asked this question, but did this thing actually work? Um, and the answer is kind of. Um, I think these holes are super true because the router bit's actually cutting the holes. They're super clean and I'll have to do minimal, if any, sanding on them, but they took a really long time. And I probably would have been better off with just a drill and yeah, the proper size bit. Um, both of those things were something I didn't have on hand, so I may do with what I had. Now the next steps are going to be painting this bad boy, which I think I'll get up to tomorrow because I need to eat and I need to have a beer. Um, and the only other thing I want to do uh, is just route around all of the edges, um, just to smooth them out, give them a bit of a round over. I think it'll be more comfortable um, in terms of an appearance, but also in terms of you know if I'm grabbing the edge of the wall for any reason or I fall, less likely to get a splinter. So um, I think it's a good idea and it'll make the painting of the edges a lot easier and like I said, look a lot nicer. So I'm off dinner and a drink. We will kick this back up tomorrow. So although it looks like I'm wearing the same clothes, this is actually the next day. I can assure you that I did change my underwear and shirt underneath that sweater, but clearly uh, I need to get more clothes. So as I mentioned, I did give this a quick route around the edges and I gave it a little bit of a light sand just to get rid of any of the blowout from the bottom of the, the holes I made and just to make it feel a little nicer. All right, now uh, it's time to paint. Um, I have some moral support here. Laura's hanging out. She's got her hard hat on just to be my foreman and make sure that I don't f this up. Uh, but I realize I don't really need her help to paint this, but I've been here by myself way too long and uh, she's just here to help me stay sane. So for the paint on the back of the walls, I just used some leftover interior exterior floor paint. I think I had this leftover from the cottage and it just was there to weather protect the back of the wall. It wasn't for texture and it wasn't for looks, so I just used what I had. I also used this opportunity to show some slow motion footage of paint pouring because, well, it looked cool. And you might be wondering why I used a paintbrush at all instead of just a roller. There were imperfections in the plywood because of the grade of plywood I got, like knots and, and little cracks, so I wanted to paint in all those sections to make sure I sealed it well, and then I went over it with the roller. I don't know if it shows up in the camera, but I got a pretty sweet uh, rip in these painting jeans. It's, uh, it's a good Stop thing. <laughs> it's a good thing I have uh, pajamas on under here because I might have. Uh, what's the equivalent? What kind of, uh, pajamas are those? They are they're Corona. Bad timing. <laughs> corona pajamas. I'll shut up and keep painting. So I tricked Laura into helping me now. So we'll get this done a little quicker, I think. You promised me pizza. Yeah, I did. All 
where I threw a little bit of camera magic, meaning I simply just didn't film it. I did a second coat of paint on this board. I decided to spare you guys and your attention span a little bit uh, and not film myself. Um, and then I'll do a quick summary of how I'm texturing the front side and painting that. And then we'll move right on to putting the T-nets on the boards. So here you can see me texturing the second board. I used a Decover paint from Home Depot. You can see I developed this interesting painting technique where I use a grid system. The aggregate doesn't go on the roller very well, so I had to do this to ensure that I was getting it on the board, and then I would spread it out after the roller. This also ensured that I didn't get the aggregate into the T-nut holes, which would start to strip the screws and T-nuts. All right, this looks uh, pretty good. I got two solid coats on each one of these boards. I have a kicker board and some extra height I still need to cut and put my T-nut holes in for, but I'm gonna save that for later once I kind of know what this is looking like. So I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. It's grippy, but not too abrasive, and hopefully it makes these boards last a little bit longer. So the next thing to do is to throw all these T-nuts in, and then for each one of those T-nuts, I have to put these screws in. There's three per T-nut. I think in total, each one of these boards has more than 120 holes in it. I'll probably grab Laura and get her out here and we're just gonna sit here for however long it takes to hammer in, you know, over 120 T-nuts per board. So, wish us luck, fingers crossed it works out okay, and we'll, uh, we'll show you that process. So here you can see us placing all the T-nuts. You can also see a little bit of black spray paint that dripped out of the holes. There's a step I didn't show, and that was I spray painted each one of the T-nut holes to ensure they were sealed as well, but I used spray paint so it wouldn't accumulate in the holes and cause issues down the road and we used a mallet to hammer in all the T-nuts. That seemed like the most reasonable way at it. It caused less vibration and ensured that the T-nut was going in the way it wanted to instead of forcing it in on an angle. And then it was just screwing in three screws for each T-nut, which as you can see was a ton of fun. That was sarcastic. <laughs> So I went ahead and just did the last check of all my measurements and all the wood I had to work with and I figured out how big I'm going to have my kick plate uh, as well as how much uh, plywood I need to finish off the top of my climbing wall. So the section at the top is going to be 10 feet uh, long, 10 feet high I should say. So two of these four foot sheets stacked is eight feet obviously and then I need two more feet out of this piece of plywood to get my total 10 feet and that leaves me with about two feet for my kick plate. I'm going to use my circular saw to cut down the middle of this piece of plywood. Um, this would be easiest done with a good table saw setup but all I have is this small table saw and it's not really good for feeding a piece of plywood through by yourself um, or if you had a track saw um, that would probably also be really good. Um, I have a circular saw is really old and actually I think it has a fairly dull blade but it's all I have on hand so I've screwed down this piece of 2x8, two 2x6 by two by I should say but it's my track guide and I'm gonna just use the circular saw along it and now I'm rambling so I'm just gonna cut to the chase and just get going on it so all right wish me luck here we go since I just talked about my build plans and measurements it's a good time to mention Climber Dad's build plan which wasn't available at the time I started this, but if it was, I probably would have used it. He is a small business owner, specifically a climbing gym owner and a YouTuber, who built his own gym and openly shares his knowledge. I suggest purchasing his build guide. It's very reasonable and will get you something super similar to what I ended up building, and probably for cheaper. I checked it out and voluntarily offered to redesign it, so no, he isn't sponsoring this message or anything like that. I just think it's a good idea to help out small businesses right now. And of course, once I got around to actually building my kick plates, I did all the same processes. The holes, the painting, everything, but I'm not going to make you watch that in its entirety. Here's just a quick time lapse. However, I will take this opportunity to thank Atomic Climbing. Part of the reason I took a while to make this kick plate was I needed to make sure I could get all the lumber I needed, so I had to pick up a few more pieces, and I also ran out of T-nuts. I had previously purchased the T-nuts knowing I wanted to build a wall, but I didn't have enough for this. So I put an extra order in, and I forgot to order the bolts with it. I immediately emailed them and tried to get them to add those to the order, 
but they were so fast that it had already shipped. Lucky for me, they actually just shipped me the bolts I purchased free of charge. So again, no, this is not a sponsored message, but I just wanted to thank them because they were actually really helpful. Got all my lumber, got my boards out here. I moved into the backyard because the sun was out, it looked nice today, and now it looks like it's gonna rain. So I'm gonna try to get as much done as possible out here, uh, and hopefully I can get some good progress in actually um, building up the frame. But yeah, um, stay tuned and see how that starts to come together. So the way I framed this was pretty simple. I did 24 inch on center, which meant that my T-nut holes would not intersect with the wood supports behind the wall because that would cause issues when I tried to actually attach my holds. It's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. All right, so not terribly impressive, but I have a frame. So I think I'm just gonna need the person behind this camera. Who, me? Yes, you. Oh. Grab it, lift it as much as you can. And while I did do a lot of this project by myself, Laura definitely helped out. And I highly recommend having two people to do this. It would be a lot faster, a lot less stressful, and it would just be overall more enjoyable. Oh yeah. You screwed it. So here you see me start to build the frame for the kick plate. Again, it was 24 inch on center, pretty simple construction, just making sure everything is square. And then the last thing I'm cutting here is the horizontal supports that I screwed to the bottom of it. That's just to ensure that it stays upright. And later I attached some right angled pieces of wood to it to allow for pins to be placed for stability. And I'll explain that all later. All right, so starting to look like a wall. Day two out here, a lot more sunny, hence the cool sunglasses. I'm gonna to try to flip these last panels onto this wall uh, and then attach the kicker to the kicker board. And then we're gonna to have to try to lift this entire thing up and, uh, and flip it around so I can attach the hinges to it. Wish us luck and here we go. It's real nice. It fits pretty much perfect. Ooh. Looks like my measurements are good. Am I allowed to compliment myself? No. hold it together long enough to, to get it in place and I can tack some more in later. So while some days were hovering around freezing temperatures, other days super warm and my pasty ass needed some vitamin D. So I apologize for the shirtlessness, but believe it or not, it was really hot out. So here you can see us start to attach all the hinges, but I will explain how they work later in the video. And then it was the matter of trying to move this massive wall. In time lapse, it looks super easy, but I can assure you it was not. I had to build a small frame the same size as the kicker to rest the wall on while we stacked lumber on the other end to raise it up to the same height. This way it was at a 90 degree to the kicker plate and it could attach the hinges appropriately. Then I just added some temporary legs to the side of the wall so that we could remove the lumber and make sure that everything stayed upright can see me start to attach that right angle bracing I talked about earlier, which again I'll get into more detail later in the video. And finally, the last thing I had to do this day was attach all the bracing within the wall. So I cut some horizontal bracing to attach the different panels together, and then I also attached some vertical bracing just for structural support and to keep the wall from skewing. Now it's time to make the new legs and try to attach them and attach the strapping, the ratchet straps I should say, so I can start to try to hoist this up by myself. But here we go and wish me luck. So these are going to be the legs 
that kick out for the actual climbing wall that are going to have the ratchet straps on them so you can adjust the height of the wall. But I'm just going to mark where I'm going to put my bolt, which is going to drive right through this at the front of the wall. And then I'm also going to round out the, uh, the feet at the bottom because as the wall starts to kick, this is the corner, it's going to start to change the angle of it. And I want to make sure that it's not going to be resting on just the corner of the wood at any point because that'll cause it just to split over time and it just won't look as nice and it probably just won't be as sturdy. So all I have right now are these obnoxiously long bolts, fortunately. So I'm gonna use them for now, but then when I have the opportunity, I'll either <laughs> grind these down shorter or I will replace them. But it's what I have for now. And again, this is kind of a frivolous project just to keep me occupied and sane. So please don't yell at me for how long these bolts are. All right, so my other half is still at work, so I'm gonna make an attempt to shimmy this up one side at a time a little bit to get it on top of this piece of wood that I've attached to this hijack or farmer's jack, whatever you wanna call it. Um, this isn't the best and most safe method, but because I'm by myself, it's better than the alternative. With those boards attached, they're blocking how I need to attach the legs on. So I'm gonna to try to get it on the top of this so it's like a second hand or a second person. And then I am going to try to attach the leg one side at a time. So wish me luck, hopefully it goes okay. Alrighty, it would appear as if I've got it high enough to start using the jack. something under it to protect the wall texture just a little bit, hopefully. Okay, and I am also just going to drive some screws into the deck to ensure that it uh, can't move, slide, or do anything on me. engaged. I'm going to attach the legs to one side at a time and then I'm going to attach the ratchet straps to the back of the wall just to ensure that should this fail at least, at least the legs will start to engage. So here we go. So while the hijack might not be used in the most appropriate way here, hopefully you saw that I had bolted it to some pieces of wood that I had also screwed to the deck to make it have a bigger footprint and be solid. I also added a ratchet strap to the piece of wood to extend it so that was always sitting on the foot of the hijack. Now, the higher you jack with this tool, the more squirrely it gets. And maybe this is a good time for me to flag that I am not an engineer and this is not a how-to guide. This is just me documenting the process I did to build this wall. And the last tip I'm going to throw out here is that if you decide to use a hijack, especially in the way I am, make sure you stay clear from the wall as well as stay clear from the angled space between the handle and the actual jack. If you're in that space and the jack is not engaged or it fails, that handle is very quickly going to snap back towards the jack and at the very least you'll lose some teeth. So please avoid that. The one last thing I should mention is the bolts. I used 3 eighths of an inch, which should be plenty strong, but when you're building something like this, you're relying on the hardware for your structure. So I think the bigger, the better. But with the way I built this, I think it's gonna be plenty strong, and you'll see at the end of the video what I mean. All right, so now this is finally starting to look like an actual climbing wall. 
I got the first pin in at 45 degrees, um, and then I got to ratchet it up to do the other angles it's going to be set at. I am also deciding to double up my legs here just to be safe, and I will also add in the angle supports today, and then it's pretty much done. So, yeah, let's get to it. Again, here you can see how useful it is having a second pair of hands. If she wasn't here, I probably would have used my clamps, but it would have taken a lot longer and been very frustrating. All right, so I've attached the second boards here, essentially making these all four by sixes, and added in the cross supports here, and the pins in the back, so as you adjust it, you can lock everything in place. So yeah, it's essentially done. I might throw a few more screws in this as the days go on. I, I think that's it. The only thing I need to do is cut the strapping for the tarp so it looks a little nicer. Uh, and then I'll walk around and I'll film all the details and show you how it actually functions and how you can adjust it. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm excited to start climbing on it. Here is another one of those clips that aren't terribly exciting, but I figured I should just show you how I made those slats that I was going to screw in the back of the wall to attach the tarp to. The tarp was going to be my method of keeping weather out of the back of the boards, so I wanted a way to tie it down nicely so it didn't flap in the wind and just didn't look ugly. All right, so I have the wall done. Um, so I'm just going to walk around and show you how it kind of works. So over here, I've added in some hardware. You see the cross beams? Yeah, this thing's super sturdy. And then I've tarped the back as well. I decided to go ahead with that. So I've added these slats you saw me cut along here. They're actually under this across each one of the 2x6 supports here. Um, the tarp was long so I doubled it back and tied it off so it doesn't flap in the wind. I have to figure out if I'm going to cut it or if I'm going to fold it over and somehow pin it like I did underneath it. But for now this is how it's finished. I've left this um, loose because this is where the hinge is for the wall uh, and it's going to change uh, shape and size. So I don't want to pin this here because obviously it'll restrict that. So um, I might add some type of bungees or something to keep it tight, but it'll keep the weather from running down the back of it as well. So I'm going to keep it long. Here you can kind of see it's all the hinge system I have along it. So I have each hinge landing where there is a vertical stud in the wall with some lag bolts in that uh, go right into the stud. Uh, the rest of them are just structural screws. I didn't use the ones that came with the, the hinges. I used longer, stronger screws. And I also added in a hinge in between each one of the studs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine hinges. So there should be lots of uh, structural strength here. Each hinge has a half inch pin as well. Uh, so it should be uh, plenty strong. This isn't the exciting part though. The exciting part is around the front. Here is how this works. I have these pins, these bolts that are in the actual wall. And by removing them on here and up here, I can start to ratchet and strap in here. And it'll start to articulate and bend the arm in and raise the height and change the angle of it. The pins are just to add just a some peace of mind while you're climbing on it to make sure that if for some reason the strap did fail that the pins are going to catch it and you'd have to somehow snap three pins on each side for this thing to somehow structurally become unsound. So again this should be plenty plenty strong and these ratchet straps have a breaking load I think of 3,000 pounds uh, and a, a safe working load of 1,000 pounds. So all the weight is going to go through structure here to the hinges to this also to the leg down into the ground the ratchet strap is just keeping the tension along here to make sure the legs don't kick out now over time the uv and weather will affect this so this should be replaced uh, it should be checked on frequently to make sure it's not ripped or torn at all um, i actually want to add in a secondary chain that can be attached with a carabiner so if in the event that somehow this did fail or i'm lazy and don't check it that there is that secondary system. Uh, this will be plenty strong for a while, so I'll come back and do that later. It's not important at this time. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. So uh, I'm gonna take these pins out because the pins also 
have a secondary purpose, and that is when you change the angle of the wall, I'm gonna drill some more holes so at 10 degree increments, you know when you're at, right now it's 45, then you'll be at 35, then 25, and finally, you'll be at 15. And these pins will mark those positions so you can stay fixed at 10 degree increments. So I need to adjust the wall up, drill those holes and put the pins in as I do that. Um, so I'm gonna remove these pins and then I can kind of show you how ratcheting the strap actually lifts the wall up. Alrighty, so I've taken the pins out of here and here. So I'm gonna adjust the wall up to only 35 degrees overhang and drill the pilot holes for the pins to go in. So I figure this is a good opportunity for me to demonstrate how it actually lifts. Now it's easier if the person behind the camera can help me by ratcheting the other side, but she's gotta film me. So I'm just gonna go back and forth between these two legs and ratchet them in and bring it up. And I'll show you how I use this um, electronic angle finder. And I'm also using my carpenter square here just to check the angle at the base to make sure that the actual degrees of orientation of the wall are accurate or as accurate as it can be. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start ratcheting it and show you how it works. Okay. You can see how as I ratchet it, it lifts up quite a bit. Just count your clicks and try to keep them even on both sides. Same on both. And the other reason for the pins as well is after you ratchet it a bit, you're going to run out of spool on the ratchet, you're going to run out of space. So you want to stick a pin in to be safe, undo the straps, tighten them, and then ratchet again to keep moving. Um, that captures the distance that you spanned outward. So I ratcheted a bit on both sides, and I'm just going to turn on my level here. So this is based on 90 degrees, so that's actually almost 43 degrees overhung. So it's only gone up a couple degrees, but that's kind of how I check the measurement. I'll ratchet a bit more until I get 10 degrees difference, so this should read 55 degrees when it's at 35 degrees overhung, if that makes sense. Alright, so that pretty much wraps it up. I've adjusted this now to be 35 degrees. You can see it's quite a bit taller now. Um, I guess the only thing I haven't really talked about yet is my matting. I actually managed to, like a year ago, pull some matting out of an old gym. And uh, it's wrapped in tarp because it's very dirty. It's been sitting out all winter, again, wrapped in this tarp. Um, the only other thing is I have a chain that is attached to the bolt between both legs to ensure that they don't spread out and cause any type of structural failure. Um, the idea is to actually split this long mat in half and have two sections that actually fill the full width um, of the space. So yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, how do I, how do I wrap this up? I guess, you know, yeah, just put a fork in it. Or, uh, actually, I know what it is. We should, I should put a hold in it. All right, like I said, I think 45 degrees is a bit too much, 35. It's a little bit more reasonable considering that I haven't climbed in well over a month. So I think the first thing I'm going to set is a really juggy problem. So this yellow jug will be the first hole on the wall. Where should I put it? We'll go right here. Always give it an extra couple of twists. Don't rip your peanuts out. Woo! I'd say that this works. All right, so as always, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. I hate saying it, but these videos take a lot of work and it really does help me out. And if you have any questions, please ask away in the comments. I'll try to the best of my ability and knowledge to answer them. But again, I am no professional. 
and I take no responsibility for anything that anybody else builds. Also, if you end up building your own home wall, or you have, please share it with me. I like looking at all the variants that people have kind of come up with for their own home solutions to not being able to go to the climbing gym. So yeah, I guess that's it. So check out this send, and uh, don't forget to check out Climber Dad and, and click on any links that I've provided if you think you're gonna be doing something similar. And I'll get back to editing my road trip videos after this. All right, take it easy.